What happens when a medieval succession to the throne goes awry? Why did England's first female ruler prove to be so unpopular? How was a 20 year period of civil war finally resolved? Find out on today's episode of the History Chronicles. The year is 1135. King Henry I has died, leaving no male heir. His only son, born in wedlock, William, had been drowned in the white ship disaster of the year 1120. His daughter Matilda had been pledged the crown by Henry's barons back in 1133, but Henry had died while fighting against Matilda and her husband Geoffrey of Anjou. In 1135, Matilda's position as heir to her father's dominions in England and Normandy was a tentative one. She had few allies among the English nobility, and no significant military presence in Normandy, where her father Henry had ruled as duke. There was one man, however, who regarded himself as capable of restoring authority in such a period of uncertainty. His name was Stephen of Blois. Stephen had served as a loyal baron in Henry I's court. He had fought with the king at the Battle of Tonchebray in 1106, where Henry had defeated his own rival to the throne, his brother Robert Curthose. Stephen was also Henry's nephew. His mother, Adela of Bois, was the daughter of William the Conqueror and Henry's sister. Stephen ruled lands adjacent to Normandy as the Count of Mortain and Boulogne. In 1135, he was a relatively minor baron, but he appeared to have many friends among the Anglo-Norman barony. Stephen was in Normandy upon hearing of the king's death. A baronial plan to make his older brother Theobald the Duke of Normandy resulted in Stephen being put forward for the role instead. It is unclear as to why Stephen was regarded as a more suitable candidate to be Duke than his brother, but this incident is one of several in Stephen's life that mark him out to have been a popular character among the Anglo-Norman nobility. What was also key here is that the nobility in medieval Europe usually favoured a swift handover of power from one ruler to the next. Hesitation about such an issue produced uncertainty, and rival claimants to the throne that would likely result in conflict. This would damage the tax revenue and be costly in the men and resources that would be needed for war. Stephen may have been popular, but it was also important for the Anglo-Norman barons to have a clearly recognised heir who can ensure stability and continue the relative peace that had been enjoyed in the 35-year reign of Henry I. Stephen now, sailed from Norm Stephen now sailed from Normandy to London. Across the Channel in England, there was really only one man who held the keys to the kingdom, and this man was called Robert of Gloucester, Henry I's bastard son. Robert of Gloucester had held vast territory in the west of England and had, like Stephen, been a loyal presence in Henry I's court. One account suggests that Robert initially refused Stephen access to land his ships at Dover, then again at London. However, if this is accurate, it seems that Robert soon changed his mind about the ambitious young baron, as within a few days Stephen disembarked in London. More on Robert later. For now, let's talk about Stephen and his ploy to gain credibility in England. Stephen promised the citizens of London the special tax status of a commune, no doubt encouraging loyalty to him as the next in line to the throne. Crowds gathered and acclaimed him as king. He then proceeded to Winchester, home to the royal treasury since Anglo-Saxon times, where similar scenes played out. Here, however, Stephen gained the support of two leading magnates of the realm, the bishop, Roger of Salisbury, who had been the royal chancellor under Henry I, and another baron, William Pont de l'Arche. Again, there remains some mystery as to why these men accepted Stephen so readily. They had both sworn an oath to Henry I, saying that his daughter Matilda was to be the legitimate heir to the throne upon the king's death. This was now apparently forgotten in the face of Stephen's swift play for power. More evidence surrounding this issue comes to light in the deliberations of the head clergyman of the land, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William of Corbeil. The Archbishop appeared reluctant at first to accept Stephen, given the oath that had been made in favour of Henry's daughter Matilda. However, another baron, a man called Hugh Bigard, stepped forward and claimed that the late king had released his nobility from this very oath. Hugh argued that before he had died, the king had vouched for Stephen. It's worth pointing out here that Hugh Bigard was not in fact present at Henry's deathbed, but nevertheless, this argument appears to have been enough to sway the Archbishop. He now too vouched for Stephen as king. With the support of the Archbishop, Stephen was crowned king on the 22nd of December 1135. Well, what about Matilda? In 1135, the king's daughter was pretty much out of the picture. Not one baron came forward in her support leading up to Stephen's coronation. Even Robert of Gloucester, her brother, quietly accepted Stephen's accession to the throne, turning up at Stephen's court when summoned by the new king at Easter 1136. 
1135, Matilda had, after all, been at war with her father, albeit through the actions of her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou. One chronicler, Henry of Huntingdon, also writes of the conflict between the late king and Matilda's husband that was worsened by Matilda's involvement. Matilda was also simply outdone by Stephen's grab for the throne in 1135. While he had garnered support in London and Winchester, she remained with her husband in the borders of Normandy. We also need to raise here the issue of Matilda's gender. While women had certainly enjoyed positions of influence and some power before in the Middle Ages through presence at court or by marriage to a king, it was unprecedented for a female to become the sole monarch of England. It is unclear just how much of a role gender played at the time, but it could not really have helped Matilda's position in 1135. With Stephen's coronation complete, the situation surrounding Henry's muddled inheritance seemed settled. Stephen successfully put down two rebellions before 1137. The Scots, who usually invaded whenever given the chance, had invaded upon Henry's death, but were soundly defeated by one of Stephen's armies at the Battle of the Standard in 1137. Stephen enjoyed baronial support, and even received a letter from the papacy congratulating him on his new position. However, something was rotten in the state of England. In the West, a large uprising from Wales went unchallenged by Stephen in 1136. In the south, Matilda's husband, Geoffrey, the Count of Anjou, still retained hold of important castles, allowing him to raid into the heartlands of Normandy. Stephen launched a campaign to dislodge Geoffrey in 1137, but rather than ending in a decisive victory for Stephen, the king and count the Count of Anjou came to terms in a tentative truce. One facet of Stephen's personality was to also emerge in these years, which went on to be a recurring theme in his reign. This was his clemency his willingness to simply forgive those who had wronged him. Down on the coast in Exeter, one baron was to do just that, and sat in his castle, refusing Stephen's summons to court. This man, Baldwin de Redver, soon found himself surrounded by Stephen's army as they lay siege to his castle. But Baldwin asked to be released, and Stephen accepted. Baldwin, despite his rebellion, went free, and the siege ended. Baldwin was exiled as a result of his actions, but then sought refuge on the Isle of Wight, where he turned to the occupation of piracy, seeking to cause discord among the king's ships in the Solent. More significant problems, though, began in the summer of 1137. Acting on the advice of the Beaumont family, uh, a family of barons at court, Stephen had seemingly grown suspicious of some of the leading bishops of the realm. He ordered the bishops Roger of Salisbury and Nigel of Ely to court, where he hoped to keep them under some kind of house arrest. The bishops came, but they brought with them their fighting men, and a small skirmish broke out. Nigel, the Bishop of Ely, managed to escape Stephen's clutches, but the others were arrested and imprisoned. Stephen's motivations here are unclear, but it seems that here he aimed to curtail the powers of some of the leading men in the realm. What happened next takes us to the West Country, where a large group of barons now stirred in an uprising against the king. This is where the king's bastard son, Robert of Gloucester comes in. Robert's lands were centred around the city of Gloucester, situated in the west of England, close to the hilly borderland with Wales. Robert had been hesitant in accepting Stephen as king from the start. Now he declared open rebellion against him. Almost as soon as he did, however, he departed England for Normandy in a bid to bring his half-sister Matilda, who he regarded as his father's true heir, back to England with him. Matilda would make a clear bid for the throne that would challenge the legitimacy of Stephen's kingship. Back in England, several landowners had already joined Robert in revolt against the king, and had taken castles in and around the south of Wales and western England. Robert's actions were a threat to Stephen at first, but not too much of a significant one. Stephen acted swiftly with a military campaign in the summer of 1139 that ousted the rebels from their strongholds, using military force or negotiation that restored the king's authority in the west. Stephen's wife, confusingly, also called Matilda, also launched her own successful campaign down to Dover, where she too dealt with these people who were challenging the authority of her husband, Stephen. In all, Robert's absence throughout the summer of 1139 facilitated Stephen's military gains in that year. But on the 30th of September 1139, Robert and Matilda landed in Arundel. The pair sailed into the small castle town on the south coast up the River Arran. Upon receiving word of their landing, Stephen marched with his forces to Arundel and enveloped the castle in a siege. By the time he arrived, Robert had already fled to his lands in the west, but Stephen now had Matilda surrounded. Negotiations led by his brother Henry, the Bishop of Winchester, took place. It is these negotiations that have largely served to damage the reputation of Stephen as king. What happened next does indeed seem surprising. Rather than seeking to imprison his rival Matilda, Stephen 
let her go. Under the protection of Stephen's brother, Henry, Matilda made her way from Arundel to her ally, Robert of Gloucester, who had now reached the city of Bristol. Why on earth did Stephen allow Matilda to go free? In the negotiations, Stephen had received a pledge from the Castellan of Arundel and Eliza of Louvain that Matilda would pose no threat to the kingdom. Releasing her was said to be the honourable action for the king. If the king was indeed being honourable at this stage, however, it doesn't really reflect his behaviour earlier in the year. During his summer campaign, he had quite happily executed 93 rebels that had acted against him in the town of Shrewsbury. What seems more likely here is that Stephen was confident in his position in 1139. His campaign against the rebels had so far met with swift success. He had had a genuine coronation by the Archbishop of Canterbury. One of the prime movers and shakers of the realm, Roger of Salisbury, could not oppose him for he was in prison too. The arrival of Matilda with only a pittance of 140 knights posed little real threat at this point in Stephen's reign. If anything, releasing her might finally help Stephen to gain the trust of Robert of Gloucester, whose support had been elusive for Stephen thus far. Nevertheless, the release of Matilda at Arundel was to lead to Stephen's undoing. The next few months from September 1139 saw a renewal of hostilities against the king, with rebels acting with the support of Robert of Gloucester in the west. In October at Trowbridge, Stephen's rearguard was caught unawares and destroyed by one of Robert's own knights, Miles of Gloucester. In November, the king's city of Worcester was attacked by Robert's army in a vicious sack that was to leave a violent impression on contemporary chroniclers. Stephen's own raids westwards, in retaliation for this attack, were similarly destructive, and now served to cause some of his own supporters in these lands to turn against him. One chronicler, Henry of Huntingdon, reports that gaunt famine awaited any of those that escaped death by the sword at such an unstable time. A real turning point though was to come in 1140. In February of this year, the king rode to the city of Lincoln. Here he was to lay siege to yet another castle that had been taken from him. The rebellious baron in this case was a man called Ranulf of Chester, who, as it happens, had already fled the scene by the time Stephen arrived. Strangely, he left in his wake his wife who was duly captured by Stephen's forces. This wife, however, happened to be the sister of Robert of Gloucester. She and her small entourage of 17 knights were now at the hands of the king's army. Ranulph's qualities as a husband aside, Stephen's actions had now provoked the wrath of Robert of Gloucester. Robert and his army, supported by the Earl of Chester and Miles of Gloucester, now approached Lincoln. Their aim was to relieve the siege and rescue Robert's beleaguered daughter. In a turn of events that was rare in the Middle Ages, Robert and Stephen's forces met in a pitched battle just outside the city of Lincoln. The battle did not go well for Stephen. His cavalry were outnumbered on the field by Robert's forces, and even his experienced general, the Flemish William of Ypres, decided that the outcome for Stephen was going to be not good. Nevertheless, Stephen fought on. The account that generally favours Stephen, the Jester Stefani, writes that the king was handed a large Anglo-Saxon axe once he'd lost his sword, and he went down swinging it, only being knocked unconscious by a rock after he was foaming at the mouth with wrath for his enemies. Seemingly overnight, the situation among England's ruling elite had been turned on its head. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle writes that Stephen was imprisoned, and it was not expected that he would ever be released. Some of Stephen's men led small skirmishes against Robert's forces, but most of his barons now hedged their bets. Matilda would be supported as the rightful heir to the throne. She processed from her base in the west to London. Stephen followed in chains. Only his wife, Matilda, and his general, William of Ypres, still held out for the cause of his claim to the throne. In London, however, Matilda's rule did not spark loyalty, but surprise. She began her rule by requesting large sums of money from the city's richest men. She also overturned that commune status that Stephen had bestowed upon the city, allowing it to enjoy special taxation privileges under Stephen. These benefits were to be no more under Matilda. Needless to say, such measures were not popular. In just a couple of months, an attack on London was made by Stephen's wife Matilda and his general William that gained the support of those inside the city. Matilda the Empress was forced to flee and made west for Winchester. Fighting once again spread west, this time to the city of Winchester, where Matilda sought to hold out against the forces of her enemies. Stephen's forces laid siege to the fortress with a strong supply route from the city of London. But Matilda managed to escape, fleeing in a seemingly desperate rush to the lands of her ally, Robert of Gloucester. Robert himself came to Matilda's aid, but in moving from castle to castle across the West Country, Robert himself was captured. In October 1141, the two sides in this anarchy met once more, but this time each side had a prisoner that the other wanted. The Empress still held the king, imprisoned in chains. 
Stephen's allies now held Robert of Gloucester. After some negotiation, it was agreed in a treaty at Winchester that there was to be an exchange. Robert for Stephen. On the 1st of November, King Stephen was released to great rejoicing, according to the Gesta Stefani. Robert was released soon after. And with that, it seemed as if the entire situation had reset. Four more years of war ensued as the Royalists under Stephen and rebels under Robert resumed hostilities. This phase of the conflict is generally known as the Castle War because it revolved not around pitched battles, but around sieges of fortresses around the country. The height of Stephen's success here, though, was a three-month siege of Oxford, aiming to capture the Empress Matilda. Matilda, however, made a wily escape in the winter of 1142, crossing the frozen River Thames at Abingdon and then riding on horseback safely to her supporters in the West Country. It was at this time also that a younger, ambitious claimant to the throne made his first visit to England. This was Matilda and Geoffrey's son, Henry of Anjou. This Henry was brought over by Robert of Gloucester, and at first made little headway against King Stephen, who had now regained ground across the country. Upon his second visit, however, in 1149, Henry was already displaying signs of winning friendship and allies across the realm. He was knighted by King David of Scotland in Carlisle, the Scottish king who had been defeated by Stephen's forces at the Battle of the Standard years earlier. Henry also befriended Ranulf, Earl of Chester, another baron who had hassled Stephen from his lands in the northwest. A new generation was now taking over this fight in England's civil war. Indeed, Robert of Gloucester had died of illness in 1149. Young Henry was to do the fighting now. By 1153, the situation had strengthened Henry's hand even further. Over on the continent, Henry's father Geoffrey had succeeded in conquering all of Stephen's lands in Normandy, establishing himself as both the Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou. Geoffrey died in 1151, leaving these lands to his son, Henry. Now equipped with the riches and resources of his inheritance and an advantageous marriage to the heiress of Aquitaine, a certain woman called Eleanor, Henry was able to mount a powerful assault on Stephen's forces in England in 1153. Henry had with him 140 knights and 3,000 foot soldiers, all brought across the channel in 36 ships. Henry's forces initially met with success as they rampaged throughout the middle of England. Henry refused to give Stephen a pitched battle and continued to win barons to his cause. The two sides, though, eventually met just outside the walls of the city of Wallingford. Stephen had laid siege to the castle here following a rebellion, and Henry had arrived to break this blockade. The two armies assembled, their lines arrayed against one another for what was to be a grand melee. But, the chronicler Henry of Huntingdon notes, both sides now shied away from battle. After years of anarchy, these men were ready for peace. Finally, in November 1153, an agreement was signed that was to finally bring to some kind of rest the inheritance dispute that had begun with the White Ship disaster of 1120. The Treaty of Winchester, facilitated again by Stephen's brother Henry, the Bishop of Winchester, promised that Stephen would live out his days as King of England, but the rightful heir to the throne following Stephen's death would be Henry of Anjou, son of Geoffrey and of the Empress Matilda. Stephen accepted this arrangement and proclaimed Henry as his lawful heir, giving him the kiss of peace in Winchester Cathedral. Stephen only reigned a short while longer, dying of illness in October 1153. By December 19th of that same year, Henry of Anjou was crowned king in Winchester Cathedral. The end had come, but had Stephen planned to fight on? In the final months of his rule, Stephen planned a reform of England's coinage and continued to strengthen the hand of his own son, William. This is surely the sign of a proactive king, one determined even to fight on to the last, and perhaps even make another bid to change the terms of the contract laid out at Winchester with Henry. History has not been kind to the reputation of Stephen of Blois. He has endured criticism for his actions at Arundel, allowing Matilda to flee, and for failing to nip the rebellions against him in the bud. The evidence against him is plentiful in that his reign concluded with the rise to power of a rival dynasty, that of Henry of Anjou. One chronicle, the Gesta Stefani, speaks up for Stephen, but even this highlights some of his errors. He arrested key magnates, Roger of Salisbury, and made enemies for himself in doing so. In the end, this damaged trust and built up hostility towards him. Historians writing more recently have highlighted these so-called blunders, while stressing Stephen's achievements, giving a more balanced account of his reign. Whatever you think of Stephen, what I hope this video has done has been to provide a more contextualised picture of Stephen, the king who presided over this period of turmoil in England's history known as the Anarchy. 
I very much hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the History Chronicles and I hope that you will like and subscribe using the buttons below as well as checking out our Patreon page and support the channel further if you wish to do so. I look forward to seeing you next time for more on the History Chronicles.